really glad to get to host another edition of the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Roundtable. Uh, first and foremost, thanks to our sponsors, without whom these events wouldn't be possible. So thank you to Katana, Moss Adams, TMC Financing, eBay, and the California ETP for your generous support. Uh, we really appreciate having this space for local manufacturers to share their experiences and raise their voices. And that's what we're here to do today. So uh, we're thrilled to have Katana's Head of General Partnership, Sean Coltis, with us here today. Katana is a manufacturing ERP software for total visibility. If you go to their website and you read their About Me section, you get a little history of Lean. And that's the inspiration for our roundtable topic today. Also with us today, Jaime Navarez of Navarez Machining and Joel Sakakihara of RJ Toffees. So we're going to talk about lean principles, uh, what they are, how manufacturers use them, and how some manufacturers might actually be running lean without even knowing it. So to get us started, what are the lean principles? Well, really quickly, they originated as the Toyota production system. Today, they're applied in all kinds of industries. So they started in auto manufacturing. Uh, they've made their way around the world and across industries to everything from you know, cars to now you know, food, even software. And that's why we tried to gather a really diverse panel of businesses today <laughs> to share how these uh, principles are, are relevant to, to each and every type of production process. So those ideas behind Lean originated in Japan in the 1930s. They made their way to the US in the late 70s. 1988, John Krafsik coined the term Lean in his article, Triumph of the Lean Production System, and he laid out five Lean principles. And those are value, specify the value desired by the customer. Two, the value stream, identify the value stream for each product, providing that value and challenge all of the wasted steps. Three, flow, make the product flow continuously through the remaining value added steps. Pull, introduce pull between all steps where continuous flow is possible. And perfection, manage toward perfection so that the number of steps and the amount of time and information needed to serve the customer continually falls. So lean is about efficiency, optimization, reducing waste, creating and delivering value. So I think reading those now that you know, any of us here can relate to some of that. And we can see how that describes what we either do in our work or try to do in our work or think we probably should be doing more of in our work. And so with that, um, I'd love to have our panelists, uh, Sean, Jaime, and Joel, introduce themselves and get this conversation started. So if you could each just um, give us a little bit of background uh, about yourselves and your companies. And let's start with Jaime. Hi, uh, my name is Jaime with Navarez Machining. A uh, little bit background, I've been, uh, I, I've been machining now for approximately, I would say about 30, about 28 years. Been in business 20 years or so. Started out uh, basically learning the trade, working in a couple various companies in the, in the Bay Area. Then uh, my brother, Hugo, who owns a sheet metal company, uh, he, 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 he rented me a little space or actually just gave me a little space in the corner and I bought a manual mill and started doing jobs for him after work. After that, he basically gave me a couple of customers and then I started getting, you know, doing side jobs for a couple of people I knew. Uh, I got busy enough that I, I went on my own. Uh, 20 years later, uh, we moved, I moved twice already from approximately 1,500 square foot building into a 2,900 square foot building. And then I just recently moved to my new location, which I bought, which I was able to purchase. It's a 5,200 square foot building. And uh, I, now I, I started off with just myself as an employee. And then I had, I had a, a one helper after six months. Now we're up to 15 people. Uh, someday I'd like to grow maybe and, and have another 15. We'll see. But that's just a little bit, uh, a little bit about me and how we, we've grown throughout the years. So it's been 21 years now in business. Not easy, but well worth it. 
a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great story of, of what's possible in the manufacturing industry here in San Jose. Um, Joel, would you like to go next? Sure. Yeah, and, and I've, I've been in Jaime's facility and <clears throat> I'm actually surprised that he didn't, didn't know much about lean because it looks very lean, his facility. So my name is Joel Sakakihara and I own a company called RJ Toffees. Yeah, we're a, kind of a small local artisan company that hand make toffee. So it's still done in, I guess you can say small batches compared to the mass productions. You know, we don't automate things. Uh, still back to the old principles of when we first started. So it started with my grandmother and my grandfather. My, my grandfather was in World War II. He's one of the soldiers in the 442nd. And he was a chef over in France. And, you know, he used to be a cook. And my, my grandma used to make toffee. And so what he is a lot of, it was very strenuous. So he ended up taking over to make toffee. It became a family tradition. <clears throat> he was diabetic, so he never tried the product, but it was the best. <clears throat> he, would, he would donate it to charities and, and that's how it became known. And it's been going on for like 70 years. My brother and I learned from our grandfather, kind of modified the process and Everyone loved it so much. We started researching to see if there's a market for what we're doing. And what we realized is that when you, back in the day when we started, when you say the word toffee, the only thing you think of is almond roca, nothing really comes to mind. So the mission and goal was to create a product that when you think of toffee, you think of our toffee, orange day toffees. And so we decided to move forward. We took two years of research and development, trying new chocolates, trying new processes, mixing the ratio of ingredients differently, doing focus groups, getting feedback. And we came up with the final product after two years. And that's still the formula that we're basing it on. Um, and from there, we started doing farmer's markets, you know, and when we first started, it was just myself, and my brother, eventually my brother kind of uh, ended up not doing as much getting us involved. So I ended up taking over the operation, but we started doing farmer's markets, small venues, direct sales, art and wine festivals, slowly got into the specialty food area. So, you know, we're currently in Whole Foods all over Northern California, most of the specialty food stores. Uh, we have brokers all over the US right now. And but this is before COVID. And then we got into Costco and Costco really kind of shaped us uh, doing the direct sales with Costco, but still making it in small batches was, was kind of hard. So, uh, but we ended up doing road shows and we set the Costco sales record. So we have the highest sales at Costco with our, with our toffee. And that kind of is where we were going until COVID hit and things kind of went south. And uh, yeah, so yeah, we're, we're still a small company, you know, uh, in our peak, we had about 20 employees and right now we only have about five. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't hire that many people this season. I couldn't find people. I had to furlough my team before, but we're on the upswing again and things are looking good. So uh, it looks pretty promising. And I'm looking forward to talking more about these lean principles later on today. Thanks so much, Joel. Sean? Hey guys, I'm uh, Sean Coltis. Uh, I'm with Katana, which is a, it's a software company. I'm the head of uh, partnerships actually at Katana. Uh, I've been in manufacturing for the, for the past 15 years. I started at a mill workshop um, and helped uh, them actually implement their software. And it was really interesting implementing a system uh, at a, a fairly uh, old company. Um, I worked for a company called Solder Industries, which had been around for about a hundred years. And so when you're going through and implementing software at a company that has been around for that long, the processes that are in place are almost set in stone and not necessarily easily changeable. But we had a great manager at the time who was a black belt in, in lean manufacturing. He had gone over to Japan and was really um, well educated in it and understood that you really need to take a process down to its core and understand where that value is. And once we understood that, it really helped us implement the software appropriately. Um, and when it, when it comes to Katana, and now I've, I've been with Katana, it's, it's a you know, three-year-old software company, but what drew me to Katana uh, from being in the manufacturing industry for years is, is really that flow aspect of it. So with the growth of e-commerce um, and orders coming in through WooCommerce or 
or uh, Shopify, it really was challenging to find a um, ERP solution that easily would bring in those orders and organize inventory and optimize raw material purchasing. Um, and that's really what Katana does. It, it streamlines that whole process from the Shopify order coming in through e-commerce, creating that demand, eliminating waste and excess inventory, and then flowing through to um, you know, maybe QuickBooks or Zero and integrating from that perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm with Katana now and, and really enjoying the ride of being on a startup um, as well as um, providing a solution to manufacturers that allows them to implement lean, lean, lean principles and then allows their business to continue to scale and grow. Um, so excited to be here today and appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is really a, a great panel to provide these different, you know, different perspectives on something that is, is so relevant to really any business. I think a great example of that is, you know, Joel, you were saying, well, Jaime, I've been to your shop and it looks pretty lean to me. And Jaime just before that was saying, you know, I never, I never knew about lean principles. I've been working towards, you know, ISO and, um, you know, it, it's really interesting how, um, you know, they're, they're very pervasive. They're, they're very much common sense. Um, but then they're also, you know, I think require a lot of, of intentionality um, in their application. And um, actually, Joel, I wanted to, to put the first question to you and, and, you know, happy for any of our panelists to, to jump in and follow up afterwards. But, you know, Joel, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, when did you first learn about these principles and, and start implementing them and a little bit of your journey with uh, with implementing them in your business? Sure. I, I actually did not know about lean. I actually didn't know about manufacturing. Oh, oh, by the way, I'm actually a college professor. I wasn't into business. My brother is a software engineer when we started the company. So I didn't know anything about food manufacturing. We just kind of threw ourselves in and, and had to figure it out. Uh, so lean is something that we, we've kind of, Kaizen is something that we've always been a strong followers and believers in. So that kind of guided us as we started the company and we always had that mentality to make things better. So inadvertently, we started applying lean principles and, and then I didn't start learning into, about until I worked with Gary Baudet, who's a black belt in Six Sigma and he was a consultant that, I, that we worked with that came into our facility. And I've also worked on other projects with him. And then he kind of changed my mind about the whole lean manufacturing processes and all of a sudden I'm, I'm able to identify waste, right? I'm looking at everything and nothing, there's so many things that could be changed. And that kind of formed the paradigm. And that was maybe a few years ago. Um, so, but prior to that, I would say one of the biggest steps in us becoming lean from the beginning, aside from us continually improving things would be Costco. So in order to get into Costco, you have the GMP food safety audits, which is a 10 hour process. And you have to have every, your documentation, kind of like ISO, you have your documents all in order. And we had to put together this food safety program, uh, HACCP programs, go through all this training. And so we had to standardize our processes. And in the standardization process, we made it more duplicatable. We had documents to prove what we're doing. And that way we can train our employees differently as well. So without knowing about it, we were standardizing. We were doing cross functionality between departments, people learning different skill sets, having to apply this into different areas of our workstations. You know, we, we're not doing dealing too much with machinery. We do assembly lines. And so for our packaging, we had the people doing packaging had to learn all sections of packaging. And I also have them do manufacturing as well. And our sales team, I'd always have them do packaging and sales so that when they're out in the sales field, they are part of the process and they are actually part of the making process, which makes them more credible. So we did the whole cross functionality and I'd have to say trying to scale with Costco forced us to become lean, operating on tighter margins, figuring out ways that we can scale. We started off, started off a three pound batch and then it went up to 10 pounds, then up to 15 pounds. By the time we're in Costco, I had the Costco corporate team come in to our rental kitchen and we were only doing 20 pound batches, but we had to do thousands of pounds. That causes a problem. So we ended up, I ended up scaling it to 94 pounds and we doing, you know, and, and changing the whole workflow of things. So as we started developing this and learning, and as I started learning about lean, 
you know, we would streamline our waste so we don't have as much waste with the packaging by moving different people into different positions with the flow of things. And then I learned through Toyota manufacturing that you, the you, is the most efficient way of running manufacturing. Uh, it cuts down back on so much waste, the amount of people that's needed in order to make your processes work. And so right, kind of right before COVID, we started implementing the U design into our flow for packaging, which made it flow seamlessly and reduce the amount of motion that we were doing. But then when COVID hit, we had to social distance, so we couldn't do that. So we had to kind of change everything. Um, but that U line and doing spaghetti diagrams of how many times we're moving back and forth to eliminate waste was the, something that we did to quantify the waste that we were, we we're doing. And one thing I want to do, which I haven't done because we're not allowed to wear watches or anything, but I like to calculate how many miles a day we walk within our manufacturing. I bet you it's uh, several miles a day of wasted movement. And, and if you can do that, I'd suggest doing that uh, because then you may find ways to streamline things. Uh, implementing 5Ss is another thing that we did in order to clean up our shop uh, to make sure that we don't, we have everything that we need right there versus walking a few feet or down the hallway to get something. Having things in locations where you're not bending down so that the employees won't injure themselves or other things that we kept in mind where they didn't have to bend too much. And as we we're starting this, we also implemented time trials into our processes to see who can do the things the fastest. Now we're not operating machinery. I don't know if you should do that with machines, but in an assembly line, uh, do time trials for every person. We do time trials for the entire team and people got creative and they found ways to streamline things, but we had the final spec, right? There is a certain standard that they have to hit with quality and we hit it and they had to have, have all the weights, you know, we do spot checking and everything, but they were able to get their times down. They create different ways of packaging, different ways of putting things into packages. And from there that created new standards that we can use to train other people. Um, so when you put people under pressure and as our company became under pressure, we found ways to, to make things a little bit lean. And again, as we were scaling, we weren't producing enough fast enough to supply Costco. So I had to look at the amount of hours we're spending per day with cleanup and setup. You know, that's about, I don't know, three, two and a half to three hours for cleanup and setup. And we're doing that every day and then we're cleaning up, then we're going back, starting the cycle again. And this is really inefficient when we're, we can just do continuous cycles. We're not doing 24 hour cycles like I know a lot of manufacturers do and some of us here probably do 24 hour um, runs, but we changed, we went from nine hour or eight to nine hour days to 16 hour days with multiple shifts to eliminate the setup and the cleanup time. In addition, when you have ingredients for us that are just idle, not doing anything, that's waste. It doesn't really add value to the end consumer. And that's one thing Gary taught me. And so we would, in between sets, we'd pre-melt the butter, which, and then we'd dump it into the kettle when we're starting the new cycle, which would cut time by about 25 minutes per cycle. And in total, if you look at all these things that we implemented, we would cut about five and a half hours out of our day of waste that we didn't, that we were initially doing. And so having that mindset and understanding the basic principles of what adds value and what doesn't add value is really important. And I have to say, the one factor that changed us the most to become the most lean was COVID. Because when we, we went through COVID, we had no money. Everything stopped. Costco, we didn't have any roadshows. We didn't have any, you know, direct. So this is during springtime going into summer. We weren't shipping. We're panicking. And so we still had to do some production. And I told my team, we can't have any more samples when we package because we, we have, we sort them both, we break it up, we package it. And the wasted product we use for samples, but now we don't have any events to sample people to, you know, in Costco, we would do thousands of pounds of sampling our product to the customers. Farmers markets, art and wine festivals, we do the same. And just telling my, my staff, we can't, we can't have any waste. We, we don't have the money either forced them to think differently. And we went, okay, our batches are 94 pounds. Before COVID, we averaged 87 pounds when we were packaging for Costco. The rest, 
you know, uh, seven pounds of waste that we would have. My, my team went from 87 units to 94 units, 100%, not making any mistakes, being very precise. And the, the people on packaging saw what was going on because they're also a manufacturing side and they made adjustments on the manufacturing side in terms of how they're going to do quality control with our almonds to make it perfect. And if it weren't for COVID, we wouldn't be hitting 100% with zero waste with our packaging process. So in addition to that, this past season, I couldn't hire anyone because people didn't wanna be hired and I hired a new supervisor and then she, she quit within a couple of weeks. So we had to operate with less people. And the weird thing is I, I had a talk with my team, like, you know, we need to get this done. We have so many pounds we need to do. And with three and a half people per day, we were able to operate and produce as much packaging as we did with six, seven people per day in the same time frame, and, and that cut back on the amount of people we're using because we're doing cross-functionality. We have people doing multiple, once they're done doing something, they go to the other one. And the urgency of what we needed, they did it for the team. And so uh, I, wouldn't not, I would not have known about this and been able to implement this if it weren't for COVID. And that, those are some things that we did uh, for, our, for our lean manufacturing. Thank you for sharing all that, Joel. I'd love to hear, Sean or Jaime, is there anything in there that you relate to that you wanted to, to rebound off of? Uh, yes, uh, well, actually, I, I, I said, I mentioned that I wasn't too familiar with lean manufacturing until you sent me that link and I started reading up on it. But like, uh, like you, you mentioned, you visited my site and so was Joel. Uh, actually, when I moved in here, I had a, I have to give all the credit to my wife and my supervisor who actually, I, I gave them the idea of what I wanted and I let them take over and, uh, and lay out the, 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 the shop, kind of like what he just mentioned as at a U where there's no wasted movement. And if you've, if you've been to my shop, that is it's exactly what we do. We have all material coming in from the, backside goes into the machining side goes into uh inspection from inspection and then moves over to shipping and receiving and then goes out the door so there's not no we, we, i told i told him i want to make sure we have no wasted space we don't want to be going back and forth and, and and so that's why you you look at my shop my wife laid it all out she put everything on labels on everything and sometimes i even get on her because i'm still old school i thought what are you doing but once she finishes a project and the guys out on the shop look at it and then I look at it, it's like, oh my God, it's so much easier because she, she puts, uh, you know, labels on everything. This is here, this is here. So the guys are not having to, oh, I have to find this. No, it, they know and it, everything is in a centralized location. So we, there's no wasted uh, time or, or movements because they know exactly where everything is. Likewise, once we became ISO, we had to make sure that everybody knew exactly what they were doing. Where before, everybody used to have to come and ask Jaime. Come and ask Jaime. And I would, I, I would fight with my wife and said, hey, you're doing all these things. But now that we have the work order and has specific instructions on what to do, they don't need me at all. Because it tells them, it's, all they're doing is looking at their work order and it gives them specific instructions, which she puts in. And they know exactly how the part has to be ran. The inspector knows what he has to check. Likewise, in shipping and receiving, they know if the part needs to go uh, in a bubble bag, what size bag, everything is documented where they don't have to come and guess and say, or say, hi, man, how do you want this ship? All the instructions are all there for them. So it makes just the flow of the of product easy to come in the door and out the door. So I, I, without even knowing it, I was already running the lean principles. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, like you said, uh, what I think is so interesting is once you start thinking of waste, not just, you know, the waste that you drag out to the, to the bins for collection, but wasted time, wasted movement, wasted energy going and, you know, Hey, where's Jaime? I need to ask Jaime a question all the time. When you start to think about how can you remove all of those wastes and focus on just creating value? There you, there you go. There you have it. You're, you're running lean, whether you know it or not. Um, yeah. John, and, oh, go and ahead. Another thing as, as, a, as an owner, right, or 
as the supervisor, as a manager or stuff, I learned to kind of, when I, when I first started out, you know, you have to realize that every employee brings a different uh, value to the company. Before I was always just looking for, okay, this guy's too slow. This guy's, you know, he's not fast enough, but you're never going to get any, everybody to working at the same pace. So you have to know what guys can do and you have to ad adapt your company towards that as well, because, you know, not everybody moves at the same pace. And so for me, it was to drive me nuts, but that guy that doesn't go, you know, a hundred miles per hour, maybe goes 80 miles per hour, but he's here five days a week, he'll work overtime where the guy that runs hundred miles per hour, 110 only comes in four days a week. So you have to kind of understand that people are human and, you know, we all going to work at a different pace. We all uh, absorb knowledge at a different, but at the end of the day, if you have these, uh, the, the instructions and the work, everything flows and everything will still get done. So that's, I, I mean, I, it's hard to adapt but it, I, I've adapted over the, over time. I think one of the greatest things that you said, and one of the hardest things when you think of lean principles is actually sustainability. Uh, so when you talked about your wife putting labels on the products and then having, you know, a really clear communication on your documentation around what your employees need to be doing on the shop floor, those are, those are implementing or are allowing you to keep uh, whatever they do implement uh, in a sustainable environment. You know, I've, I've seen it so often where if you don't have um, sort of management support in, in putting in a process that is going to be sustained, it always will revert back to what the employee is used to doing. So you really, if you are going to implement any lean sort of principle or, or make any changes, it really has to be very clear and straightforward for them to understand, because otherwise they're just going to revert back to what they're used to doing. Um, and then, you know, Joel, I thought you had a, a great uh, point around, around walking and, and the waste in, in people moving. Um, you know, often I've done hundreds of implementations of ERP systems, a lot with machine shops. I worked for a company for, for seven years called ShopTech uh, doing the E2 product. And um, while I was doing those implementations, the, the most common uh, thing was the sales off, the salesperson and the purchasing person, their carpets going in and out of their offices were completely worn out because people were, they were either walking out to the plant to look at whether or not they had something in stock or where a job was, or people were coming in to see what should they be working on. Um, and they always needed direction. And, and that communication and that waste of time walking in and out, wore out not only wore out the carpets, it wore, wore down the people. Um, and so when you can put in a, and implement a system that provides that information at people's fingertips and avoids that wasted time walking and, and they can just easily see, yes, I have it in stock. Yes, this is the priority of the job. So people know what they need to work on right away. They're working on the right jobs at the right time. The inventory is arriving for the job that's you know, lined up to be worked on. Um, it really just flows much more smoothly. And it's amazing when you can see the amount of waste that goes on when you start to look at it through, through that sort of lean lens. Yeah, I, I love, Joel, I love that uh, tip of, you know, use the step counter if, you're, if your watch or your phone has that feature. I think that's something that, you know, everybody should try, you know, throughout your work day, see how many steps you take and see where you might be able to save yourself a little bit of extra time and energy. Although I know some of us are trying to get to 10,000 steps every day and might be taking, you know, the long route around just to hit that number. But um, one of the things that's that's come up in the conversation that I think would be really interesting to hear you know, examples from, from many of our panelists here are, the, is, the, is the question of employee engagement. And we, we talked a little bit about, you know, how important it is to have buy-in from the team, to communicate clearly with the team. Maybe we could hear some examples of times where you got a great idea from a team member. You know, Jaime, I loved what you were saying about, you've got to understand what are the different qualities that each of your team members bring. And, and maybe somebody doesn't go hundred miles an hour, but maybe they have an idea that, that brings something that, you know, helps them to be just as productive. And um, so, you know, I'd love to hear from, from any of our panelists or hopefully from all of our panelists, you know, stories about employee engagement and, and ways that you've been able to incorporate feedback from your team into making your production you know, more efficient? Uh, well, one thing that just off the top of my head that comes up is that I always assume everyone knows what to do because I showed it to them. 
And as a teacher of communication studies, I realized that that is totally not true because I can tell my students one thing and they'll all interpret it differently. The same thing with my team. Exactly. So what I do, when I, I always get everybody, like I said, cross-functional to, to do manufacturing if they're in packaging. If they're in sales, I have them come do manufacturing. <clears throat> I have them break down boxes because to me, it's very simple. You just fold it and you break down boxes. But it's funny to see everybody do it differently. And not everyone does it the way that I thought they would. Some of them would just stomp on it like it's a trash compactor. And I'm like, whoa, I, I would never think to do this. And, and others would fold them up and they'd put them like in a really nice, it looks like a shelves within another box. Um, but just looking at people, the way think people do things differently is really important to, I guess, creating like Jaime said, everyone's a little bit different, but also creating processes that work. So uh, the ones that we do, we allow some flexibility because people operate differently and they can be more efficient with certain areas. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's one thing that comes to mind when when you're when you're talking about that. And as we we're starting the company, I had a lot of te retired teachers and engineers that were working for us, and they would actually they thought differently than. I did because I don't, I didn't know anything about manufacturing, but they did, at least the engineers, and they would streamline all the processes and that became our standards. Uh, one thing that we've done that I haven't had a chance to do is before COVID, we videotaped, we were gonna post it on YouTube, we're gonna create all these modules of every single process um, and from manufacturing to, uh, to packaging, and then we're going to create kind of our own channel for all the employees or the standards that, you know, that they can uh, retain all the information and go to if they need training. And that way we don't need to train them all the time. I don't, I don't have to because I'm the one that does most of the training. So, yeah, that's just, those are just a little, some things that my, my team has done. That's great. Hi, Mayor Sean, do you have any examples of, you know, food that you've been able to with, uh, I think it's important to uh, never underestimate some of your employees. Uh, one example is uh, I've always had my manager that's been, that works for me, be, been a guy that's had 15, 20 years of experience, knows how to program and all that. So when, when I, when I last got rid of the last guy I had, one of the guys out on the shop, a young kid that worked with me, he wanted to step up and, and said, he said, I want to do the programming. And I was very hesitant. I was like, Raul, you don't, you only have so much experience. And he told me, Jaime, give me a chance. I can do it. So I thought about, I spoke to my wife and we said, okay, we're going to give you a chance. And it was the best decision that I've ever made. I was so hesitant because I didn't think he can do it because of the experience. But his ideas and his knowledge and uh, his, it just, it just uh, overwhelmed me. I mean, it's just, he, it, by leaps and bounds, he outproduced any of the other guys that I've had. And it's just because he just has fresh ideas. And sometimes it might not be the way you would do it, but his way is actually a better way. And uh, it's just, you know, sometimes you have to learn that. So that's one thing that I've learned is sometimes you have to give somebody an opportunity to, so, so that they can shine and help the company and he has done it so that's one one advice i would give to a lot of people out there is hey you know you don't underestimate your employees sometimes you'll be surprised on what they can do yeah and i totally agree with that and, and i think another thing you uh, uh mentioned is you know everyone is a little bit different but everyone also communicates a little bit differently and so a lot of times you might expect, you know, if someone has an idea, they would just bring it forward. If it's a good idea, they would just tell me it. Um, but that's, that's not how people always work. And so if you can put in a system that allows someone to maybe type in when they're working on an order, how they did something, um, and, and then you're doing those time studies so you can see, wow, this person is more efficient. And they made a note here. They actually, you know, fold the box this way rather than uh, the way that we were supposed to do it um, because they found it was more efficient. And so giving an opportunity for your employees to provide feedback other than just coming to you with it um, is an excellent way to, to continue to improve and drive change within the operation on top of also 
collecting that data and understanding how long did things take and where are the opportunities for improvement? Where are the bottlenecks within production? So it's kind of pulling that all together, but great, great points. Well, with us in, in, in machining, we, we do a lot of, mach we set up different jobs and hold the parts differently. So one of the things that we've done now that makes life so much easier because of technology as well, right? I guess I would say is now we, we take pictures. So I tell mm -hmm. everybody, when, you, when you're doing a job and it's taking you, don't let the next guy six months down the road have to struggle. Take pictures, give them to, now we have an assistant, a, a, a young girl who's very savvy. So we just send everything to her email and she takes pictures and puts them in the setup sheet. So next time, six months down the line, the next guy gets it. He doesn't have to go ask that guy or come and ask me, hey, how did you hold this part? He has a picture and he has the a perfect idea of how, to, how it's done. And there you go. So technology goes a long way as well. And at first, again, I was hesitant towards that even. I was like, I would tell my wife, what are you taking pictures for? Come on. <laughs> now it's just like, you know, because, you know, again, machinists, sometimes we're like old school. We're like, you know, but it just makes everything so much easier. So you have to let technology work. And uh, pictures, perfect. I like that uh, comment that what's I'm saying about the YouTube. That that's a good idea. Even the, you know the channel. I, I, I like that for the training purposes. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to add before I forget. Uh, you know, Jaime is talking about the team that's doing things positive and right, but you also have equal the amount of negative and things that people are doing wrong. And I, when I look back at our processes, some of our biggest successes have been the failures of people and, and the way you interpret it. Because we have documented every single batch we've ever made. It could be in the millions of pounds. Uh, and so whenever we make a mistake, sometimes through serendipity, you get a new formula. And that's how we've been able to create changes within our, our formula that have been positive. And by the way, we've also been rated number one in the United States, best taste in toffee. And it's also through the serendipity of making mistakes Sometimes someone will burn something, but then that burnt actually could add a different flavor. And so through mistakes, we've, a, we've actually created a lot of processes. People that were underweighing, you know, we're doing a, a big order for Costco. We had several pallets already done, but we didn't spot check. We we're doing random spot checks and we didn't catch it. And so we ended up having to redo thousands of pounds and it costs so much money. And so to, to fix it, we just implemented different policies and processes, spot checking every single one, documenting everything. And so, yeah, with, with the positive, with the negative come the positive. And it's also important to, to through serendipity, you can actually make changes to your company that are very positive. And that's how we've kind of shaped our, our company. Now, let me ask you a question. So when that happens, do you then like uh, still have how many different of that toffee do you have then? Do you have like one, do you keep the original yeah. one? Like, so like right now, a flavor so we, we, good question. So we have, uh, our name is plural toffees because when we started, we we're gonna have a whole line and we have formulas for coconut macadamia nut, you know, green tea for different markets, but we only have one and, and, and we, we've actually, use the things that went wrong to create that formula to make it better through Kaizen, constantly improving. But we do plan on bringing more out. What happened is I wasn't expecting to work with Costco in the beginning and whatever we could make, we could sell. And so I did, we didn't get a chance to expand lines. And then we got so caught up in paperwork and documentation through tra traceability that I didn't want to cross contaminate our product with other allergens, which means we had to create new processes new documentation. I already have thousands of pages. I don't want tens of thousands of pages. Uh, so we will eventually bring it out once we have, I guess, like a, a software like Sean, Sean has, something that's going to streamline it a little bit different from what we're doing right now. But we do have some formulas that we would like to bring out later on. But right now, I guess it's just keeping up with what we have and, and getting the distribution in place for that. So I'll let you, you'll be the first to know, Jaime. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you are neighbors after all. Um, well, I loved, you brought up, you know, Kaizen again, that idea of, of constant continuous improvement of, of striving for, for perfection. Um, I, you know, I'd love to, 
I'd love to ask, how do you, in, in your different in your different businesses, how do you um, keep your eyes on the prize, as it were, when you know it's it's out there on the horizon, perfection that you're you're seeking to attain, and you want to stay motivated and keep your team motivated? Um, how do you find that you know whether it's using the lean principles or something that you would now relate maybe to the lean principles that you, you know, keep yourself and your business uh, on target and, and always moving forward. One of the most effective things that, that I've seen is, is really just mapping out in detail your entire workflow from sales order through to um, manual entry of the order, if that's the case, where that the steps and every person involved. And, and if you have a documentation of your process from start to finish, um, it really helps you identify visually um, the opportunities for improvement. Um, I think that that is one thing, you know, currently, you know, actually at our software company, we're implementing a new software ourselves called HubSpot. And so we had, it's a complex company with development and lots of different channels within the, our business. And by mapping it out and understanding all the different workflows within the business, it made the implementation and the improvement of processes actually possible. Without actually documenting and understanding your processes in detail, how can you improve them? And so I think that that is imperative if you really are going to continue to improve your solution. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Sean. And I'll even take the opportunity to, to plug that that's one of the services. A value stream map is something that Manufacturer San Jose can help you out with, any manufacturers in San Jose on the call. Um, just a, a quick one. Um, and obviously, you know, Joel, it sounds like Katana is something that could end up being very relevant for you in the not too distant future. So um, that that's obviously uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to I wanted to ask Jaime a, a question. We're gonna probably switch to audience questions in a few minutes here. So I'm gonna sort of go through my last my last round of questions for each of the panelists. Um, and I wanted to start with Jaime. And I wanted to ask you. You mentioned a couple of times being sort of an old school guy, having that perspective of you know 30 years of experience in machining. What would you describe as as the biggest changes, the biggest difference between you know, 21 years ago, you started your business to, to where you are today. I think the, in my instance, I think the, the biggest changes that I've seen is I've seen uh, in the purchasing departments of most of the big companies. I think the the one-on-one -on -one interaction back 21 years ago, you used to actually have somebody that you would actually know that knows knew, knew who you were. And now most of the people that are doing the buying are, and I guess you, it's, again, you got to change with the times. Nowadays, it's a college student with a degree, very good at computers, and all they care about is numbers. So they'll, they'll send a spreadsheet, and if you're the lowest price, you get the PO, where 20 years ago, you actually uh, knew the person buying they knew who you were and they would give jobs to you and a couple other guys and they would spread it out accordingly. And now it's just whoever is the lowest, that's who gets the job. So I think that one-on-one -on -one connection with, with people, now it's just all computer. And before we used to do a lot of phone call conversation. They would call you, you would talk to them. Hello, how was your weekend? How are you doing? And now it's all via email. I, I, I rarely get any phone calls everything through email so it's kind of that's just the way things are and, the, and I, I miss the old way because I, I like again I hate to always keep saying that I'm old school but I kind of miss that interaction with the person on the other side and knowing who it is and what they're buying because before a lot of the people buying were actually people that knew how to make a part and what it took to make a part Nowadays, I, I'm going to give you guys an example. You'll get, us, you'll get somebody and they'll tell me, your, your price is too high. And so they'll say, why, why do you think it's too high? And they, would have, they have no clue. They have no clue on what they're even buying. And so sometimes it's frustrating, but I guess you have to adapt and, and, and change with, with time. But a lot of the kids nowadays, like I said, 
they'll just send you a spreadsheet here. And if you're the lowest, they'll give you the price. And that's it. And sometimes I say, hey, I'll call them and tell them, why didn't I get this job? Well, somebody got, somebody was this much lower. And I go, and I tell them, that's impossible. I go, because the material costs $15. How can they charge you 12 bucks? They didn't do their due diligence to, to even uh, price the material correctly. So I go, you're going to give them a job and they're going to lose money. They're going to come back to you telling you, hey, can I get more money? Because I, I made a mistake here. Or before the person on the other side would know that already because they knew what it cost to make that part. You know, we've heard a lot of great ideas of ways to leverage new technologies today, but we also have to acknowledge that there are some trade-offs um, and that you can't, you don't want to get out over your toes. You don't want to get, um, you know, too excited about using all the newest, latest technology and, and forget what it is that you're actually, uh, that you're actually trying to accomplish. Um, Sean, I wanted to ask you, you've done a lot of, of implementations. I wanted to ask you if you had one, you know, specific example where you've seen a, a really transformative implementation uh, in, in your career? Yeah, so I was working with a machine shop. Uh, Greg Yitman was the operations manager there. And um, they, were, they had no way to track time on jobs. Um, and so essentially they would create a job traveler and they put it out into what they, what they called their hopper. And so that's where they would, it just like the, Next job would go on the bottom of the pile and guys would kind of grab the ones off the top. And so they never really knew how profitable their jobs were. And they had some big customers. And after they implemented the system, they realized that their big customer, they almost lost money on every single order they did for that customer. And so prior to that, they were, you know, taking this customer out for dinner, you know, they're, and, and, you know, they're, they're treating this customer like they're, keeping the lights on and to a point, you know, they need those orders and that revenue overall. Um, but, uh, but that was something that really stuck out when they were able to actually identify the total cost of a job uh, from, you know, actual runtime from employees to the raw material costs and the overhead. Um, it really painted a picture and allowed them to go back to that customer with the data and the details to say, listen, we know that you've been a great customer of ours for 20 years. But our prices haven't changed much over that time, but employee wages and material costs have. And, you know, here's the data. Let's like, let's talk about what makes sense for us to continue to do business together. So that was that was a huge um, uh, sort of win for that business after implementing the system. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Joel, my my question for you is actually you mentioned at the very beginning that you'd, you'd seen Jaime's shop and you said, wow, this place looks pretty lean. What was it that made you see that? And, and what were you seeing when you, when you saw that, that, that you would describe as lean? What, what kind of, what are the signs if you walk into to any shop that would tell you, oh, this place is, is lean? Yeah, so with, I, I, I haven't been in a lot of machine shops, but Jaime's shop is very well lit. The, I mean, there's, it's very bright. Uh, I've been in some machine shops where it's very dingy and dark. You, you can't really see where you're walking. Five S's. I think he implements five S's. I don't know if you do, Jaime, but it looks like it. Uh, it looks very clean aisles where no one's going to fall and trip. Everything's taped off. He has the yellow tape around the machines. Uh, and so it's, it's very well organized. You know, I, I don't know the flow because I don't know his manufacturing processes, but it seemed like a good flow when I was in there. And everyone was doing a good job. It, they looked happy there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it is very, very clean. And again, I, I don't know lean manufacturing with machines with what he's doing, but you know, everyone had the materials at their stations. Um, and so I was, I was really impressed. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed, especially yeah. considering some of the other ones I've seen. <laughs> But one, and I, I get a lot of people that come from other machine shops like to come visit or friends of mine. And, and once they walk in, that's the first thing they tell me. Wow. But one again, one, one of the things that my wife, she's very, uh, the, the, she very uh, particular, the, the shop has to be very, very clean. And says it, it should be clean enough so that nobody's going to get hurt. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing and that all the aisles are always uh, walk, you know, they have everything is easily uh, accessed to. 
So she's very, uh, she's on us constantly. And sometimes I even tell her, hey, you forget it's a machine shop. You know, it's going to get dirty. She says, no, you have to implement these in systems into these guys' head. So like that, it becomes uh, natural for them every day. And you can see it. They automatically, without us telling them, they'll clean in the morning. They'll clean at in the end of the day. And one of the reasons people are happy because it's the environment. You know, if you get somewhere and it's all clustered, you can't think. There's stuff all over the place. I think you're naturally, right? You're, you're like, oh, what am I supposed to do here? How do I start? You can't. You can't get your motor, your brain going. So I think once you have something and everything's uh, lit up, everything's you, your next job is lined up, labeled, it's easy to start your day, start thinking and, and get going. So I think we strive for that. We try to make sure that everybody knows exactly what they're doing. As soon as they're done, they're on to their next job and it makes everything flow. And that's one of the things that we really, really strive here. Yeah, clean shop, clean mind, right? Yeah. Uh, I think I had the same feeling as, as Joel when you were describing all of your wife's efforts earlier. It's, it's very 5S. Um, anything, any last words from any of our panelists before we, we ask if there's any questions from the audience, anything that, um, that I missed or that anybody wanted to share that's come up in, in conversation? I just want to say I love Joel's perspective on taking a really challenging time with COVID and turning around and finding the positive and how it enabled your company to find some uh, efficiencies and, and run a leaner operation. Kudos to you in taking a challenging time and finding the positive in it. Thank you. Congrats, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're coming up uh, five minutes left on the hour here. Um, anybody in the audience uh, have any questions that you want to ask for your for the panel? Um, I would encourage you to to go ahead, take yourself off mute, and uh, and get into the conversation. Phil, if I can uh, just jump in really quick for a question for Jaime and Joel. So, uh, Joel, you know, you've been in your shop for a while now. Jaime, you just moved into your shop. Uh, so your perspectives might be a little bit different. But what do you see as sort of the next step in your uh, evolution to be uh, more efficient? Uh, yeah, good question. I have a small facility for what we're doing. When I bought the building, it was not made for... Costco freight and pallets. Uh, it's more of it was more of a boutique style catering company that I purchased and changed it into a manufacturing company. So our layout is not and the flow is not made for pallets, but we deal with thousands and thousands of pounds. And so I, I did I quantified what we have been doing through waste. When we do a Costco pellet, an average order is about 5,000 pounds. And so for so we have pellets, we need to package it in one room, but the doorway is not big enough for the pellet to get through. So we have to stack it onto rolling carts, then open up the walk-in coolers and then stack it on pellets there, then re put it back on carts and put it on the pellets outside when we go to the freight trucks. So we do three times the amount of lifting. So for an example, I just did a delivery for 10,000 pounds uh, at Costco. And so I had to lift 30,000 pounds. And I don't want my people doing this because I don't want workers' comp issues. And I take steroids. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. Uh, so we, we need the way that we do it is we'd have to change our facility structure. We'd have to change the doors on our walk in so it's all pallet friendly. And then we need to get another location because we can't store this. We need a Costco style palletization with forklifts because our facility is not built for what we're doing with the volume that we're gonna be scaling to. And so that was a good question, Mike. I, I think uh, we're gonna to try to manufacture where we're at, but we'll have to store it in a big warehousing cooling units where we can have forklifts and, and so forth. So Jaime, do you wanna? Thanks, for, Joel. Yeah. For us, Mike, the way, again, the way, uh, once, once I moved into the facility, I. I I did tell my wife and I told my supervisor, once you guys lay out, and I told you and Phil when you came to visit, I said, I want to make sure that not only are we having the flow of all the jobs going through the shop, but we have to also keep in mind that we are going to grow. So right. we have to uh, strategize the machines so that we 
have room easy accessible to for new machining machines in the future so we specifically laid out everything so like that on the other side of the building we can always add three or four more machines when we need to so like that we can keep growing as a company and i think the way it's laid out it's perfect uh, i can actually move the saw put in the next machine right next to there and then add on the other side of the building right where we, so we get we strategize this is the way we want to implement and grow in the future and that if i could just follow up on that jaime when you were looking at spaces uh in san jose uh did you have that in mind that the sense that um this wasn't this was a long-term uh sort of residency and and that you will need space uh to grow so um it wasn't just about what you needed at that moment, just you were having an eye on the future as well. Correct. Well, you always have to because you got to keep in mind for us uh, machines, it, it, it's a, quite a bit, a lot of money to, to move the equipment. So you don't want to be moving, you know, every four or five years. You know, there has to be something that you're going to move into and, and be able to stay here 10, 15 years. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, and ideally, I would have liked to get something a little bit bigger, but, you know, the everybody knows this silicon valley is super expensive so you also have to uh uh again i go back to the old school mentality my father always taught me that uh he never had a credit card my dad when he came into this country from mexico he never had a credit card always bought everything cash except his first house but he never uh he he never uh got into so much debt that would get him in trouble so I'm always thinking that in back of my mind. And if you if you walk into my shop, I'm in the I'm in the mentality that like for example, all my machines are paid for except one. So my the, the what's keeping me uh, above water all this time is that I always I don't ever overextend myself. So once I pay off that machine, I'll buy another one. This way I can always afford and, and it, sometimes it's a hamper because of, of growth, but I can get sleep good at night. You know what I'm saying? Not overextending myself. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a great point, Jaime. You do want to always sleep well at night. No wasted uh, no wasted hours. No wasted energy. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap up now. Thank you so much, uh, Joel, Sean, and, and Jaime. Really appreciate your perspectives, uh, your willingness to, to share your stories. Um, great to hear from all of you. Um, thanks again to our sponsors for making the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Roundtable possible. Katana, Moss Adams, TMC Financing, eBay, and the California ETP. Uh, we really look forward to the next edition of this event coming in the first quarter of 2022. And uh, we'll leave it with a happy holidays, everybody, and, and happy new year. See you in 2022. And uh, in the spirit of continuous improvement, we'll have an even better program for you next time, but this one will be tough to top. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.